This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. Let's be honest. The days of only dating one person at a time feel a little old school. In the recent Dating Diaries report, eHarmony found that 45% of Gen Z singles are comfortable dating more than one person at the same time. But while dating multiple people at the same time is fine when you're honest about it, it can be exhausting constantly searching for that special connection. eHarmony can help you find someone who gets you. Their well-rounded personality quiz and expansive profiles help to show the real you and can lead to that genuine connection you've been searching for. So join the dating app that helps you find someone who gets you and see for yourself. eHarmony. Get who gets you. Start free today. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Patagonia, southern Arizona, and I'm surrounded by desert. It's dry, dusty, and touching 80 degrees. I'm also looking down at a plant, and it's mesmerizing. It's the perfect spiral where each leaf is between the two other before it. Because of this, when you look towards the centre of the plant and its series of concentric circles, your eyes and your mind fix on patterns that for generations have fascinated indigenous people, botanists, even psychologists. They've actually demonstrated that meditating on that spiral shape uh, has immediate physiological Effects. The small plant is just one member of an enormous and diverse family, agaves. Succulents that, when seen at a distance in a desert landscape, might resemble a cactus, but are most definitely not. Agaves are in an entirely different group of plants related more closely to lilies and asparagus. This is Gary Nabhan, resident of Patagonia, one of the world's leading ethnobotanists, a writer and activist. Among his many influential books is the recently published Agave Spirits, the past, present and future of mezcals, the drink we'll be focusing on in this programme. But for now, let's stay focused on the main ingredient, the plant we're staring at in the desert. Agave plants can take decades to mature. In the harshest of environments, with little access to water, they slowly grow within their spiral of leaves, a pineapple-looking heart, the piña. This fibrous, starchy, sugary heart stores an impressive supply of moisture and energy. If left to its own devices, the plant will pollinate once in its lifetime and, in a desert landscape, play a crucial role as a keystone species. There would be a flower here that might be two to four centimeters long, a tubular flower, that the bats have very long tongues and they hover in front of the flower. And while they're sipping nectar, pollen is brushed on their noses and sometimes on their wings. When they go to the next flower, 100 meters away or 10 kilometers away, they carry that living pollen and pollinate that other plant. Some of the bats that I've helped radio collar have shown up 120 kilometers away on the same night. However, thousands of years ago, humans figured out that the piña, the heart, can have many valuable and delicious uses. And in these arid landscapes over millennia, people have interacted with a mind-boggling array of agave diversity. There's about 14 domesticated species and another 40 to 60 wild species that are elaborated into distilled beverages in Mexico from this one group of plants, the agave. Compare that to whiskey, rye, scotch, rum, or gin, where usually only two or three crops are used for that. Wheat, barley, and corn, or rice and sugarcane. This is so much more diverse in its basis from the plant kingdom, but in addition to that, instead of one highly genetically engineered brewer's yeast to convert the sugars in the plant to an alcohol, in some batches of mezcal there might be 30 kinds of yeast and 70 kinds of fermentation bacteria, over 100 
microbes that are helping pull out different flavors and fragrances from the plant's materia prima and converting that into something delectable that we sip. So really there's more biodiversity in a single bottle of mezcal than in all the scotches in the world or all the gins in the world. And I'm not trying to put down those other drinks because I value their place in our cultures too, but mezcals have them beat by a long shot. More from Gary Napan in a moment. Agave spirits, including mezcals, are not only among the most diverse drinks in the world, but as they've grown in popularity globally, they've also become one of the most debated, disputed and controversial spirits you can encounter. But before we get into that, let's follow one example of the process that transforms this succulent plant into a spirit. From southern Arizona, I've crossed the border into Mexico, headed one and a half thousand miles south and on to the state of Oaxaca. I'm visiting the farm of mezcal producer, or mezcalero, Eduardo Lalo Angeles, and it looks as if the earth is on fire. In a patch of land, roughly a quarter of a tennis court in size, steam is escaping through a mound of dark earth, inside which are hundreds of piña, the hearts of agave. They've been cooking for five days, and the moment has arrived to remove them by hand, as my guide, mezcal enthusiast, Chava Paraban, explains. So it's a conical oven that has been digged into the earth, and what they will do... How deep? uh, In this case, this maybe will take like maybe six tons of agave, I would claim, six to eight tons. It goes down maybe like a meter and a half, two meters. Diameter, I think we're talking about like four to five meters. And uh, what they will do is they will throw wood in the middle. They will set that on fire and will then start throwing stones on top. You're transferring all this energy of the wood to the stones. And then when they're ripping hot, you throw agave fibers on top of that. To protect the agave, you're going to be throwing on top of that. You pile all this agave, you cover it with dirt and you let it cook for days and days and days. And what stage of the process are we at, do you think? We are at the happy moment. We are at the happiest of moments when they are retrieving the agave that has been cooked. Just to describe, there's a group of one, two, three, six people who are surrounding the the pile now. Some people with their hands. I don't know what the temperature is, but they're taking the, the agave and then the soil off. And there's a basket as well. And so the cooked... Agave is being Retreat. collected. Yes. And it's such a sight because the st- this is it's steam. steam. It's, it's steam. steam the, coming, yeah. It's the heat coming from the mm-hmm. from the ground beneath the agave that's making its way through the pile. It's such an amazing sight. Every time I have the chance to come at this happy moment, I bring a little like mezcal with me because I want I, I like to tr- be drinking this and, and trying this. Cheers. Yes. Cheers, sir. Well I'm smelling this because it, it's it's I'm getting the full picture. Yeah, like I think as, as complex the Gaiave spirits are, nothing beats the experience of coming here. What happens next and the small and large differences you'll find in each farm or palenque is so complex and diverse. Entire books, such as Gary Naphan's, have been written on the subject. But to sum up, after the agave is cooked, it's crushed and broken down, then placed in barrels or vats to spontaneously ferment before finally being taken through the magical process of distillation. The agave spirits we're focusing on in this programme, with the huge genetic diversity of the agave itself and thousands of producers tucked away in remote parts of Mexico, one batch will be different to another. On Lalo's farm, from the bottom of a pot still that looks as if it comes from another millennium, a clear liquid is gently trickling. You have a pot down there, a ceramic pot that is receiving the heat that has all those fermentation juices that's allowing for alcohol to evaporate. And then you have, if you come here, this is your condensation. So it's condensing here. You see, there's a little piece of rope there. Uh, it doesn't have but they put a piece of agave, an agave leaf, that will collect the mezcal, and that is going to be directed outside. So if you put your finger here, you have mezcal. What proof is that? Oh, that's low. That's like in the 30s. 
and, and that's what you do. Super interesting. In fact, you do it all over again, and the second round of distillation takes the strength of the spirit well into the 40s. What we're witnessing at Lolle's farm is unique to his family's Palenque. But in the last decade or so, because of an explosion in interest in this drink, recorded production has increased, according to one estimate, from 1 million litres in 2011 to more than 8 million litres today. And as with the most famous agave spirit tequila, big money is moving in and operators are scaling up. The concern is that if this trend continues, the authentic spirit of mezcal could be lost. Gary Naban. The diversity is not just in the plant and microbial material in the bottle, but the ways that is carried from the field into the fermentation vat, the still, and into the bottle. So that wooden barrels and clay jars and and bottles and vats help retain the microbes more than a stainless steel or plastic vessel can. They nurture that those microbes in there and just like in uh, the rafters of an old brewery in Belgium you retain all the wonderful microbes it gives great beers of Belgium their enormous flavor and fragrance. We need to keep those traditional processing techniques like the ones in Oaxaca, not just for tradition's sake, but because they are the conveyors of that richness of flavors and fragrances that the plant starts off with. In the last decade or so, a significant fan base for agave spirits has been building in the UK, with more bars stocking up on rare and special mezcals, restaurants featuring them on menus, and importers developing their own brands. Back in the UK and inside a studio, I brought together three people who have played a role in that story. Hi, I'm Matthias Ingelmann from Kohl Mescaleria. I'm looking after the agave program over there. Hi, I'm Santiago Lastra. I'm the chef co-owner of Kohl Restaurant. Hi, I'm Crispin Somerville. Uh, I am co-founder of El Pastor, a small group of Mexican restaurants here in London. I asked each of my guests to describe the breakthrough sip that made them fall in love with Mezcal. It was on the banks of a river uh, outside the town of Acapulco in a, in a kind of town called Pie de la Cuesta. And the restaurant was called Donde Paulita, Paulita's place. And she was um, about 75, would cook this amazing grilled fish. And then uh, the um, Mezcal would come out of a sort of... Uh, plastic jerry can and uh, it had a sort of sweetness a fiery strength uh, and uh, an almost spiritual high uh, that could be attained (laughs) from uh, drinking lots of it Um, for me it was um, it was in Mexico City in a student flat with like two rooms but you have like 20 people or 30 people or 40 people there I don't remember maybe it was like sunrise where most of the people leave and some of the people were already sleeping in the floor. There was one of the guys that took out of, uh, of his room this bottle for, from his hometown, Oaxaca. It was a, a plastic uh, Coca-Cola bottle with no label. And then he just, you know, just, just served some, uh, some of this liquid in these like red plastic glasses. And it was just incredible. It was such a mystical moment because I never tried that drink in my life. And it sounded very Mexican to me, but really unknown as well and delicious. By that time, tequila was uh, more famous than mezcal. And people in, in Mexico will see mezcal as something for the poor or something that people will not, that will not have like a mineral of quali- high quality. And, uh, and in that moment, I was just, like, so intrigued. Um, yes. what was and the, uh, the air is oh. suddenly filled with an aroma. <laughs> <laughs> Matthias, brought along. Yes, yes. Is, is this the... Yes, the, that's the mezcal. That, this is the mezcal that was a breakthrough drink for you. Exactly, that stood out for me. So I don't have this, like, Mexico story. I have, like, the story from working in bars in, in Europe and then discovering mezcal slowly through working in bars. And 
Yeah, mezcal was always introduced by the big brands as like the smoky, smoky cousin of tequila or like basically the Isla whiskey, but from Mexico. And it was like interesting, but like it was, I didn't really, never really got it. And then one day we actually got a bottle that was not smoky and not, I don't know, one of the big brands, but something like from a different state, not from Oaxaca. And we got a um, bottle of Salmiana from uh, San Luis Potosi. Mm. And I think that was a moment when I realized, oh, wow, mezcal is so much more than just like this one flavor. There's so many different flavors. There's so many different varieties. There's so many different ways of producing it. And like, it can be so incredibly special. And uh, that's why we brought the bottle with us. Uh, so it's um, a mezcal made from a special agave. It's called agave salmiana. It can grow like two meter 50 high. And uh, it's made in San Luis Potosi, which is a state northeast in Mexico. It's one of the official states where you can make mezcal these days. Um, and it's known for producing mezcals that are not that smoky normally and quite uh, herbaceous, green, lots of like chili notes quite often and uh, really, really different to what you would expect. The aroma is super strong. It's to me... Um, and of course, this is completely subjective. I get a sort of um, really soft milk chocolate and a oh, kind wow. of aniseedy, um, like fennel. And I'm really excited about um, trying it. And uh, for transparency, it's about 11.30 in the morning. <laughs> um, and I think this is the, a whole new breakfast of champions. Folks, I'm going in. Salud. Yes, salud. 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 Te quiero. Yeah. Via Mexico. <laughs> it's a really nice first mezcal to be drinking of this selection because it's I, I find it very gentle, very rounded, very mellow actually. I think yeah. it's interesting what uh, what Crispin mentioned about the fennel. You know, I think it's it has this like sweetness of the of the fennel flowers as well. I think we're getting a lot of like green notes, like fennel notes, but then it's it's also oh, quite it's, herbal. It's very herbal, yeah. but fresh at the same time. Mm -hmm. What makes a mezcal a mezcal and not a tequila? What I usually say is that tequila is a mezcal, but is restricted to by state, by agave, and by production method, while mezcals are all other agaves, and these days also restricted by nine other states, and much more artisanal production methods. So why would you restrict yourself to just one agave in one state when you can have them all? That's why we drink some mezcal. And there's another term I think we should explain, uh, ancestral. What does that mean? With ancestral and artisanal, we're getting into the specifics of producing mezcal. So ancestral means it has been clay pot distilled. So the distillation happened in, in clay pots. It has been mashed. So after the cooking process, the agave have been mashed by either hand or with a tahona, which is a massive stone wheel. And it has been cooked um, underground. While then there are other ways of uh, classifying mezcal where it can be um, distilled in pot stills out of copper. Or it can be mashed with a thing called a wood chipper. Um, or it can be cooked in like autoclaves. And then obviously there's mezcals are all naturally fermented. So using airborne yeast to ferment the um, this agave mesh. So that means that you have obviously very, very different outcomes and every mezcal is heavily influenced by what's going on, on around you and by the season and by the people around you. You can also just add some yeast, what happens in tequila these days or what happens in all other spirits categories to make it more uniform. Okay, to take people through some of those terms and what does that mean for the taste of the drink? You brought some bottles in. We brought actually an ancestral mezcal. So it's uh, distilled in clay pots from Santa Catarina Minas, which is a really well-known village for clay pot distillation. It's like the, uh, the capital of ancestral mezcals. And uh, the agave is called, or the maguey, it's called Baril, the agave is called Kavinsky. It's an agave that's really well known to be like quite herbaceous, dry, mineralic. Um, you get a lot of the terroir from that area. It's extremely different. It's like almost 
has like in a good way I always say a bit of like dustiness on the nose. It's almost tannic. Yeah. And it's uh, really, really dry. It's a family that produces mezcal mm. since generations. And they're really known to like master this type of uh, distillate and this type of uh, distillation. So the yeah. family started to produce these uh, mezcals in... 125 years ago. Yeah. 1898. Yeah, you get like a pear or queens. You can't mess with Santiago's palate. Um, but I certainly go with this kind of surge of cut grass and greenness. Um, and then you go to this really sort of earthy, musky place. Wow. Yeah, it's amazing. And, and what strength is it? I'm going in at like 43 or 44. Um, uh, it's 52. It is ex 52 is incredibly high, right? Yeah, it is yeah. so smooth for that. We're only scratching the surface here and with such a diverse world to explore, wouldn't it be helpful if somebody took the trouble to make an entire radio series focused just on agave spirits? Well, luckily they have. Agave Road Trip, launched in 2020, has clocked up 180 episodes, covering everything from controversies over certification schemes through to agave, bats and biodiversity loss. Hosted by Chava Periban, who we heard from earlier in Oaxaca, and Lou Bank, this is a podcast with attitude. Two dudes named Lou and Chava In a car, not built for back roads Trouble back roads never meant for cars Their singular objective Is to learn about agave Bring the knowledge back to Queen Gopher As the name implies, Agave Road Trip takes listeners out into the field in search of the flavours of rural Mexico, sharing knowledge about agave spirits with the aim of supporting small-scale producers and their communities. I joined Lou and Chava on the road trip in Oaxaca. So we're, we're very specifically in the Mixteca region, a Mixteca region of Oaxaca, and we're headed to two communities. Uh, we're headed to San Jose de Rio Minas and to Yutanduchi de Guerrero uh, to visit a bunch of mes mescaleros. And one of the things I love about these drives is it's long and it's deserted and in the middle of nowhere, suddenly you'll see people just walking and you know they're going exactly where you're going because there's one road, there's one direction. And uh, so you'll invite them into the car and they're always astonished when they look at us because we don't look like the kind of people who would be driving in these communities. And so they ask what we're doing here, and we tell them we're in search of mezcal. And pretty soon they're telling they're telling us, oh, okay, in the next town you need to visit this person and this person and this person. So that's what we're doing on this trip is revisiting some of those people that I met back in 2017 on a trip in the same region. This reveals a lot, I think, about mezcal. The fact that you can go on the road and actually head off in a direction in search of mezcal and discover something that you haven't seen or tasted before yeah. says a lot about the relationship between the drink and, and this part of Mexico. We've learned, well, I've learned, I mean, Chava probably already knew this, but I've learned uh, that taking that risk almost always results in something great and successful. And every once in a while you get stuck and you have to turn around. But if you don't take the chance, you don't find the wonderful stuff. And put it, put it all together, 150 episodes, what, what is the, what's, what's the idea, what's the, the mission? What's the story you're trying to tell, get across to a, an audience? Well, I'm trying to get people who don't visit these communities, who don't live in these communities, to better understand that, to recognize that there's something else going on here. But if I can communicate that to bartenders and other hospitality workers, people who work in restaurants, those are the people who help us decide what we're going to eat and what we're going to drink. And the better armed they are with information about these communities, about that, that different worldview, the more that message will be communicated to the broader audience. Also trying to communicate the importance of small-scale production is John Darby. 
His own road trips in Mexico are geared towards making small-scale batches of mezcal available through his San Giusano project. The aim? To create an audience of curious and informed drinkers. I'm, I'm in Mexico uh, for my project, which is uh, all about the promotion of diversity that exists within artisan agave spirits. I run a subscription club for agave spirits called the Mezcal Appreciation Society that uh, receive a box in the post every two months that contains two small bottles of of really, really interesting artisan agave spirits, tiny batch stuff. I've directly sourced myself from producers all over Mexico. Uh, We run tasting events. By creating a supply chain that links directly back to farmers, John's aim is to help small producers benefit from the mezcal boom. If you go to Chiquita, where most Chiquita is from, as far as the eye can see, you'll see rows and rows of monocropped blue agave, which is the only one that can be used to make tequila. And a lot of these less than completely sustainable farming practices going on. And a bunch of big industrial distilleries that are producing most of the tequila that's exported for hundreds and hundreds of different brands. And it would be very sad to see that happen to mezcal but in the years i've been revisiting oaxaca you can see more and more fields planted with a monocrop of espadin which is the which is the plant that's the mezcal equivalent to the blue agave and tequila such are the pressures on mexico's agave diversity and on rural communities because of the boom gary nabhan believes the drinks world needs to go even further His book, Agave Spirit, contains a manifesto and action plan ranging from the protection of wild agaves through to the investment in health clinics for the welfare of workers. If there is no plan, he believes, Mezcal's popularity will not benefit the people and families who for generations have made these drinks possible. We want them to be respected and economically honoured for their knowledge, not just that they're a source of brute labor in fields in some of the hottest parts of the world. Gary Nabhan, and there's more information on the Food Programme website about the stories and resources we've featured. Because there is so much to be discovered and enjoyed, and equipped with enough information, agave spirits can have a positive future. For the last word on that and the drink, back to the studio. I think it's the most fascinating spirit in the world. I think there's no other spirit like it. Just from a a technical level, the way how it is produced, the way how this agave grows over such a long time, but then still this incredible artisanal process of producing it with the elements of nature involved in it, it keeps you you on your toes, basically. It's It's just incredibly fascinating. It's, uh, yeah. I think a really beautiful illustration to the point that you just made is... Um, Matias has just pulled out a bottle of Jabalí. It's one of Col's own mezcales. It starts with Mezcalero, the name of the Mezcalero, the guy who made it. Then the village that he lives in, which is Santa Maria Zocitlan, the state of Oaxaca. How long the agave was growing for, which was 12 years. How long the agave was cooked for, which was 72 hours. Over which woods? Encino and Mezquite what the device was to mash it up afterwards, which was a horse-drawn tauna. None of this is marketing crap. This is is the story. The (laughs) fermentation, six to eight days in pine vats. Distillation, twice in a copper pot still. How much of it was produced? A thousand litres. When was it made? April 2021. And that's what we get to drink right now. Come on. Salud. (laughs) Salud.